Hey, welcome and good morning to you. Uh, this week's edition, a day late of the uh, Good Morning Show. Uh, my bad, because, uh, uh, you know, it, it's been a bit of a hectic week. Our guest this week is Megan Jackson. She's a lovely woman and is the founder of Joyful Mud Puddles. God, oh, I love that name. <laughs> Thank you. I, I'm going to ask you actually how you chose that because like, I find choosing a name for your business is really exciting. So what Megan does is she um, has homeschooling and parenting coaching and her work is focused on supporting parents and guiding them from feelings of overwhelm, which if you are a parent today, you probably are feeling and frustration towards uh, having more confidence and peace in parenting and in your family unit. Megan uses a combination of experiential activities and gentle parenting techniques while working with families both online and in person. And she also writes a blog from the heart about life parenting and homeschooling with her three adventurous boys. Welcome, Megan. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Good morning, everyone. Yeah, a joy. So my first question, well, I've got a bunch of questions, but one of the big challenges, you know, parents are having is managing work and, and needing to be home more. You know, I, I'm, I'm noticing an ad, I think it's for one of the banks, I forget who, and this father's trying to, you know, raise his daughter or brush her hair, and, and then the banker says, oh, after I finish going through your, you know, financial picture, I can help you with, you know, doing our hair because I got three daughters of my own. So how can we manage um, that, 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 these things that are pulling at us now, you know, where we are at home and we are raising family, we still have to work. I think a lot of empathy and grace comes into play and just knowing that everyone's in the same situation gives you a chance to just let go of some of that guilt and and stress because we're all juggling we're all challenged in the same way but definitely focusing on what your priorities are and your greatest needs whether that's making a list of what like specifically has to be done for work or school or family tasks and really just putting those on the schedule or I like to go more with a rhythm rather than a schedule because I don't like being tied to like set times. But if you get the big anchor points in the rest, you can go with a little more flexibility and account for the fact that you have kids and they're going to, you know, things pop up. So if you can put the rest of it in a little more flexibly, that helps a lot. What and also, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. No, no, you go. Well, time blocking helps too, because sometimes we feel like we have to get it all done and it's swirling around in our head. And that big giant to-do list makes you feel more stressed and agitated when you are interrupted. But if you can say, okay, today I'm just going to focus on this area of life or this area of my business, knowing that you've planned the rest of it out during the week or during the day, then you can really focus in and not have to carry that whole to-do list at the same time. What about the idea of holding weekly meetings with the family and saying, hey, this is what it's going to look like this week. What do we, what do we, what do we all want to do? you know, and, and sort of planning, you know, jointly. Um, how, how about, you know, inputting something like that or putting that into place rather? Family meetings are huge in my world and what I suggest to families because there's so much that can be addressed in a family meeting. You certainly want to make time to go over the schedule or um, any events that are coming up. But we like to really start our family meetings with appreciation. Mm -hmm. Just taking a few moments to, of gratitude towards one another just really sets the tone and makes it less business-like. And I encourage families to have a list, like a, a spot where the kids can add or anyone in the family can add to the agenda. So then they know that their concerns are being heard. And then they won't nag you and bring it up and do the tattletaling 
because they know it's going to be addressed in the family meeting. And so you can actually address like behavior or fights or other problems in that and then focus on solutions, not punishments or retribution, but like, hey, here's a problem. How are we going to fix it? Let's go through this and move on. And then make sure you add some fun to the meeting. I, like, do it over dinner or popcorn and then plan a fun event like movie night or dinner out. That way you're creating memories and making meetings more enjoyable. I love it. We're, we're talking parenting uh, in, in these times, which are really, it's challenging every one of us uh, who are parents. And, and with us is parenting coach uh, Megan Jackson. What about, you know, managing uh, the fears we might be having right about now? Because we're now, now we're getting into August and we're, we're, we're hearing that, yeah, you know, a lot of doctors are recommending and especially psychologists are recommending that our kids go back to school uh, this fall. How about managing one's fear come the fall in terms of our kids going back to school? And it's that dichotomy between it's good for the mental health aspects of kids going back to school, but then there's that slim risk that they could get ill. How do we I think, yeah, I think that families really need to shut out all the millions of voices Take, you know, take them in as input, but try, you can't please everyone. And you really need to focus on what your family, what you need and what's best for you. And then be confident in that decision because we don't know. It, it, this is a complete unknown for all of us. And we don't know exactly what's best or what's right. And so you have to just make a decision, but also know that it's not permanent. If you go to send your kids to school, just send them in the best way that you feel that's best for you, be as protective as you can, and then trust that if you don't feel comfortable, you can change that. And same with if you choose not to send your kids and there's options coming up, we're still unsure, you may wish to homeschool, you may wish to take their online options, but you can change your decision. Uh, don't try not to be wishy-washy, but, you know, make one, pick it, and know that you're not locked in and that you're doing what your gut tells you is best for your family at the time. And that's, I mean, we all grow up and say, you know, my parents did the best with what they knew at the time. But that's, you know, you got to let go of that guilt and that fear because then you're not going to make any decision or you're going to make panic decisions that you're going to regret. Yeah, and that's so important because, you know, look, at none of us have been given a playbook to operate right now, you know. I, I, I don't think a playbook's been, been written on this. Um, so to have guilt and fear and am I a bad parent, to me is a, a, a wasted, you know, uh, emotion or they're wasted emotions and you're wasting your energy. All you can do is what you just said. Educate yourself, make the best decision in the moment, and, and be open that, you know what? If you need to change, you can change, right? And, and if, but the school could change too and say, hey, guess what, kids? Yeah. You, we're learning online again, you know? So, well, they did. I mean, they, they had to make that call to close the schools. Like, they're just everyone's just doing their best and if you operate out of this guilt and fear you're bringing that energy to your family you're bringing that stress and then that's when you're getting more agitated and then the kids are picking up on that and then the whole family unit falls apart and you're all at each other's throat if you just calmly make one choice and just settle in and do your best with what you've got you'll find you'll have a lot more peace with each other so um, some of the other issues, you know, we're facing these days are job loss, uh, changes, economics. Um, how do you explain to your kids, too, in terms of, because this is hard, right? You know, th th this is not easy stuff. How do you explain to your kids, you know, that you might have to watch the spending and they might not get that cool pair of Nikes for school this fall? I think the kids pick up on a lot more than we give them credit for. 
and that they really want the whole best for their family in mind. But I caution parents to be careful about how much you're bringing to your children. You want them to be aware of what's going on, but without scaring them, you know, because especially the little ones, they pick up on that and they, they don't understand fully what's going on. So certainly um, in simple terms, explain to them and then don't dwell on it. Like it's again, the energy you bring. Okay, so we're not gonna do this, but hey, we're gonna go camping in the backyard. We're gonna, you know, have roast marshmallows over the toaster, you know, like bring the fun, bring the energy of what they can do and what great things are gonna happen. And they won't even know, they're, they're gonna forget. They're gonna be excited about spending time with you. I remember as a kid, I camped out in the backyard. I had a, I had a blast, you know? Yeah. You know, I, got, I had cheese tidbits all over the tent, but what the hell? Um, do you remember those things? Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah. They were the, they're like goldfish, only they were little rectangular things. Uh, so um, teens, you know, too, seemingly, they're not paying close attention to the physical distancing rules and regs. And, you know, truthfully, in a way, I don't blame them. I think if I was a teen, I'd be going, are you kidding me? Come on, right? Um, how do you prevent or coach your teen to be a bit more mindful when out and about socializing? Because after all, they're teens, puberty awakens them, uh, and the cool, neat summer experiences uh, that they normally have are limited in a year when there's not a lot of fun things to do, like movies and ball games and leagues and things like that. So how do you, how do you sort of coach your, 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 your team to sort of be a little bit more mindful? I think a lot of dealing with teenagers has to do with your connection and your relationship with them. Because children are going to want to listen to you more if they feel more connected with you. So you really need to make sure you're taking that time. Even they say that even one night of family dinners makes a huge difference mm. in a kid's relationship because they're going to be listening to the people they spend the time most with. So you really got to work on that relationship, bring in the fun, get into their world and find out what they're interested in and, and then ask them questions, like really get into that closer relationship because then they're being more willing to listen to you because they feel heard. And if you come at them with rules and regulations, they're gonna obviously shut you out and go be rebellious, but you can win over their cooperation by showing empathy and understanding, taking in their point of view, and then kids listen more when they feel heard then you're open to share your opinion, your concerns with them, and then say, look, I, I get it. I hear what you have to say. Can we come up with a compromise? Can we come up with a solution together? Like that family meetings we were talking about, rather than me saying, I'm gonna be strict, this is what's, I'm laying down the law, and then trust that your child in that warm environment is going to be make the best decisions and again you have to make that call if they are being reckless you're going to rein it in and again because you're the parent you're you need to be that guide but you have to know when you need to be a little more in control of the situation so i had rapid fire questions for the yeah. but you've already alluded to two i'm going to go and ask them okay uh, mentioned family dinners. Why are meals together so vital to the cohesiveness of the family unit? And how can we make the most of our family dinners? Make them enjoyable. Make them fun. It's important because that's the connection point. And for many families who are busy and on the go and working, that's the only time they see each other. And if you lose that, then there is no connection. You can't have a relationship without seeing a person. And if dinners are stressful, they're not going to want to engage. So have fun questions. Instead of the, you know, tell me about your day, come up with some more interesting questions. Maybe your family has um, like a theme or um, like an affirmation in the morning and, and a characteristic that you're working on. And then you talk about that in the evening or share your favorite memory 
of the day? What are you anxious about? Get into some more interesting questions than just what happened at school today? Yeah. Get a shoulder shrug, you know? So, oh, so yeah, make, make dinners fun, make it enjoyable, make that another connection point with your family and put the phones away if you can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Not, nothing like getting a text from your son at dinner. <laughs> He's like, yeah. Yeah, like, Dude, <laughs> just ask. How can radical honesty, this is another rapid fire question, how can radical honesty help a family work better together? Like just because kids know when you're being honest and and they want you to know that you're being honest with them and not shielding them from everything and so when you're clear and honest that opens the communication with each other i love it now another little rapid fire question you're kind of you know following you know pandemic protocols to the letter of the law. Your significant other is a bit more rebellious, maybe thinks it's all uh, a ruse, <laughs> conspiracy theory. Uh, how do you, how do you navigate the different parenting styles, you know, where one's a bit more laissez-faire and yeah, you know, do your thing and one's a bit more you know, a bit more of a nervous Nelly kind of thing. That's definitely a conversation to not have in front of the kids. Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> because then I just think they, they know whose side to get on. But really, communication in any relationship has to do with that empathy communication. Looking at your feelings and the feelings of the other person, and then considering the needs, because we all really get, if you boil it down, we all have the similar basic human needs. And maybe if you can talk more about your needs, like I have a need for freedom, or I have a need for safety, that's something you can connect on. Rather than the blame and the shame, if, you, if your partner understands your, your intrinsic need for safety and protection, they're more willing to, to, to offer that and to offer solutions to how can we manage these both. We both have different needs. How can we do that if we take away all the judgment and then focus more on, again, the problem solving together? So another rapid fire question, and then I'll get back to some other questions here. And these are great answers, by the way, Megan. I love this <laughs> And I think for those watching, I think it's going to help you hopefully have some tools in your toolkit to operate uh, more cohesively. Um, what do you recommend um, if there's a summer romance that your teen's having, yet with what's happening right now, the ki your, your kids feel guilty about having that romance, but they have urges. <laughs> Yeah. Well, they do say that if you have like a small number of people in your circle, so if you're talking with the other family and you know who you're in contact with, as long as you're all in agreement, that could be one of your 10 people. You know, like you have to work as a family rather than banning someone from a relationship. They're part of your family now. That is part of the relationship you're gonna have to say, okay, now, who are they seeing? Are they working? What can we do to protect the whole family? It's a lot of discussion. Yeah. Yeah. But it, it, it's so hard to say, no, you can't have the summer romance when, you know, there's feelings. They're gonna sneak off and do it anyway, so you might as well bring it in and say, okay, look, fine, if that family's now one of our contact families, who are they in contact in? Can we talk to them about it? Yeah. And then they, then your kids are really going to be on your side and be like, wow, my parents are cool. Like they are on my side. They understand me. They're going to be more open about other things that come up in their lives and not hide that from you. Right. And I think it's important to like the late Dr. Stephen Covey in the, you know, seven habits of highly effective people said, seek to understand before being understood. What's your take on, on that kind of philosophy? Cause it's something that, you know, again, it, it, you mentioned empathy, so it's a more um, empathetic approach 
to, yeah. to managing family dynamics and possible conflict areas, isn't it? I think it's huge. That's one of the main things I, I encourage is, like I was saying earlier, kids will we you win over their cooperation. They will listen to you. They will cooperate when they feel heard. Kids listen and and feel better when they feel heard and understood. And then and that goes with any relationship. If you understand each other and you're both going for the same needs and feelings and and goals, then that loses a lot of the miscommunication that happens. You can cut out all that judgment, all that blame, all that miscommunication and really work together. Yeah, you just put it all out on the table and then figure it out. How do we operate from here, right? Yeah. Yeah. What if, what if your teen is acting out? They're not, they're not buying what you're selling kind of thing. How can we help them in a way that's going to bring, bring peace to the family? Like they're angry, they're upset, they're feeling hemmed in. And I get that. Mine are, mine are already feeling it, and they're younger, too. I'm feeling and, I'm an adult. Well, then, it's like, so then tell them that. Like, be honest with them. Instead of trying to rein them in and just be like, dude, this sucks. Let's just, like, get, get it out on the table. Like you said, this sucks. But your health, your mental health, like our family safety, that's key. So what are we going to do about this? You want freedom. We want safety. This, like, let's just agree that this is a terrible situation we're all trapped in. Instead of getting at each other's throat and blaming each other, have a cry fest, you know? Blame, blame the germs. And then your kid will be like, wow, okay, they get it. They just want to feel heard. They want to know that you, they're acting out until you they feel heard. They're going to keep repeating and repeating and repeating the same message until they feel that you understood and actually got it. So how, how, what are your boys going through? What have you noticed since this sort of began back in mid-March? Well, at first they were like, hey, this is great. We're a little less busy because we were out a lot. And then they were missing their friends. And then they started really getting a bit depressed. There was nothing to look forward to. Every day was the same. And the only time mommy talked to them was to nag them about chores and schoolwork. And because there was nothing fun, there was nowhere to go, nothing to do, no, no events to look forward to. So we really had to work on coming up with like a list of things that we were going to do every day to get out of our funk and, um, and put mental health as a priority for our family until we could kind of open up a little and get out. Yeah. So. One of my friends on Facebook is Julie Cole, who headed up uh, or was, you know, involved with Mabel's Labels. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, labels for kids' clothes and things like Love that. Those. And she posted on Facebook uh, in the early days of this, because now, you know, we can get out a little bit more. Yeah, we still can't do so much, but we can still get out. Um, anyway, so she posted her kids' itinerary. She got six kids. And it kind of went like uh, school, uh, snack, uh, TV or gaming, you know, back to school, snack, nap, you know. So it really, really itemized the, the day for her kids to give them structure, but also to implement a sense of fun. Like at the, in the afternoon, they, they could do art or they could do painting or they could do yeah. music. Right. What, what's your take on that in terms of, you know, especially in the summer, where, you know, it's a little more, there's a little more flexibility, but, you know, in terms of our schedule, but, you know, as we, as we do get back, maybe, maybe to, to school, the, the, that kind of um, itinerary to follow, is it, is it a good thing, a bad thing? or is Necessary. It, okay. Very necessary. Because kids, well, not only does everyone thrive on structure, their security in knowing what's coming next. If you don't know where I'm supposed to be or what's gonna be expected or when's mom gonna call me and tell me that I'm doing the wrong thing, then you live in a state of anxious nervousness. And then your tolerance level for anything is way lower and you're gonna get set off. And then kids live in that 
anxiety that we see so prevalent today. So just having a strong rhythm, even if it's just key anchor points during the summer with meals, or, or you know, they know when quiet time is, then they know and that's predictable and that's one less worry they have to, they have to even think about. It's just automatic, this is my flow of my day. And when something unexpected comes up, they're so much more able to handle it. Yeah, or, you know, doing things like family hikes or morning walks or yeah. bike rides. I have a colleague of mine, again, on, on, on Facebook, who uh, she lives in Utah, and um, she has a young daughter, maybe six, seven, no more than that. And uh, so this colleague posts uh, uplifting videos almost daily. Mm -hmm. And usually she's with her daughter and her daughter is chiming in. And I'm saying, you know, her name is Julie too, Julia. I said, watch it because your daughter is better than you. you know? <laughs> um, but, she, you know, so I love her when she, she and her daughter team up. What about doing things like that? You know, teaming up to do videos or, or YouTube videos or podcasts or whatever, involving your kids in your life as well as you can be involved in theirs too. Oh, they love it. My boys are so into our business um, because you gotta also, I mean, rhythm and, and structure is great, but you wanna add in some fun and some spontaneity. Like we plan crazy theme days and you can find anything on the internet. So we've done like a whole unit just on the his like on cereal. We have like a cereal themed day or, or just like fun random party days, right? You want to make life more interesting and kids love to find out what you're interested in and get involved in your world just as much as you want them to get into theirs. My boys, particularly my middle son is just like his dad fixing cars. He's building a tractor. He knows how to do all the electronics that we do for our business. And then my oldest He's actually learned how to do all the video editing for my podcast, and we started a course together. So now he's actually leading one of the courses for my parenting for children, and he's my co-host, and he's done all the video editing, and like, it's giving him some purpose, and he's learning from life. Can I hire him? Interesting. <laughs> I think I need a little help. Um, if he's if he's free, you know, Tuesdays and Thursdays, I'm in. There you go. <laughs> um, yeah, so kids, you you're noticing you know, kids going through that that range of emotion. How can we encourage them a, a more open dialogue and expression if our kids are 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 suppressing their emotions, they're suppressing their anger, they're feeling a sense of loss and isolation or depression and they're not really wanting to come out of it maybe due to fear maybe maybe due to the the stigma that's attached to uh depression and, and, and anger and, and 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 guilt how how can we pull that out moving forward definitely you need to make feelings welcome in your home and then like make it so that it isn't a stigma. Make it normal. Talk about your feelings. We even have a feelings wall in our house. And that was mostly, like I tell people, oh, it's for the kids. And I've got these kids posters. It was for me. Like, so that I could remember they need the language. They need the wording. So even if you have a list of vocabulary or little pictures for the young ones, talk about it when they're calm practice these things you need to practice mindfulness practice um coping skills talk about feelings and help your children with the management let them know when you're struggling too so that it, it's something that comes up often in your family and just makes it more normal and then you can directly help them with coping skills and with emotion coaching um and then if you do notice that it's gone beyond just a bad day, get help. Like don't, don't ignore mental health. And I think everyone is now really focused on that. If you know you need help, get the help. Um, I offer some emotion coaching through kids courses and parent coaching, like on how to do emotion coaching. We've got like mindfulness and coping skills and all that. But if you need 
more than that, definitely make sure that you are getting that help for your kids. And you know, I have, um, I follow uh, a day, I have a daily morning ritual of uh, meditating, journaling, I do a gratitude journal, and I do affirmations, and then I exercise. And I do that every day before my day really kicks in. How about involving your kids in that? Because I feel like without that morning ritual, I'm not the same. When I have that morning ritual, I'm empowered. I, can, I, I get a lot further and my mental state is way healthier and clearer. What about involving your kids in some sort of a morning ritual that speaks to them? Because you know what? They might not like saying, I am loving and approving of myself, like Louise A suggests I do. Um, that's my affirmation, one of them. But yeah, how, do, how can we maybe encourage our kids to develop their own morning ritual as well? I think it's critical and it's fantastic. I mean, we're not raising kids, we're raising adults like they're we're raising them to be adults why not teach them real life if you're doing it and it helps you would it not help them too you don't hide things away just because they're kids that's we teach them life skills and mental health and and mindfulness is a life skill just as much as cooking and doing the laundry so you need to get them involved in all of these things there are so many resources out there on fun kids versions of all of these things. There's kids yoga videos, there's kids affirmations, there's all these things. Whatever is working for you, teach them coping skills, teach them anger management so that they don't have these problems when they become adults and they have no idea how to manage themselves. Yeah, there, there's, um, you, you know, there's a, an organization, I forget the name of it, I'll, I'll probably post it. Um, it. It's here in Toronto, and it's based on a model that was done in Baltimore. And it's these former um, sort of 20, 30 somethings that had run ins with the law. And what they now do is they go into schools, inner city schools are a little rougher, and they teach uh, yoga and meditation to kids. And what's happened? Bullying has gone down, self-esteem up, violence has gone down, grades up. So, you know, there's there's a real correlation between a practice of meditating, uh, yoga, uh, mindfulness that 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 helps helps sort of um, you know helps anger acting out. Um, bullying, violent tendencies to almost disappear. What's your take on that? It's, that's it. That's, that's exactly it. It's self-control is like that self-regulation is, is so key. And those are all the great things towards that is being able to breathe. We, they say that you need to breathe to calm down. You don't calm down and then breathe. You, breathing helps your body to calm down. Um, I love Daniel Siegel. He talks about um, this hand brain model, but that when you're like, if this is your brain, when you're stressed out, you flip your lid. And so this is like your, you know, the, the thinking part of your brain, it goes and you're working on fight, flight and freeze. But when you breathe, it reconnects it, gets all that oxygen back into your brain and you're able to focus. And anything you can do to calm yourself down, whether that's breathing, mindfulness, yoga, anything, there's so many different coping skills available. The more tools your kids have, the more you practice when they're calm and make it enjoyable so that they realize that being calm is a great state to be in. Then when they're agitated, they can calm themselves back down. That cuts out so much of the behavior and the bullying and the fighting and the anger because they're able to regulate themselves more or else use you to help them regulate but get calmer again. Right. And if you're doing homeschooling, that's a great thing to teach. You know, if, yeah. if it's an after school program at home, right? So a couple of last questions. How can we be more aware and hold back when our kids are um, acting out and pushing our buttons. Is it the same thing? Breathe, relax. Breathe. 
you got to not take it personally. Kids are not out to get you, even though it feels like it sometimes. Mm -hmm. They're having a hard time. They're not trying to give you a hard time. Their behavior is a message. And if you can receive it as that message, not that attack, then you're going to, you're going to respond differently. You're going to respond with that empathy and love. Right. And you really need to, as parents, parents always come to me with problems for their kids, but then they realize that parenting is 90% the parent and only 10% these strategies and the kids, because really it's what you bring to it. So you really need to do that work of self-regulation and calming and, and the way you speak and the way you act towards your kids. That's right. going to make the biggest difference. And, and if they're tapping into a, um, you know, into a vein that, that, that hasn't been healed in yourself, you know, admit it. Hey, you know what? This, this hurts. You know, this is something that, that I don't appreciate. So kind of be real with them, right? Because they'll be real. Yeah. Um, yeah. Now, um, okay, we talked about the parenting and the conflict styles. Yeah, you know, the... the easy going dad, <laughs> maybe the more intense mom, or vice versa. Uh, I don't think, uh, you know, everybody's different. Um, the last thing is, you know, how can, as parents, how can we deal more proactively with issues of, of guilt and shame? And because like, and I think you alluded to it already, we're all kind of going through this. So there's no, like, there's no guilt, you know, it's just like, do your best. So how, how can we sort of manage still if guilt is coming up or shame issues, maybe, you know, as I said, economics might be a factor or uh, dad's not going to work right now, or, you know, you're working from home. How, how can we, as parents, deal with our own guilt, shame, as far as parenting goes? It's a lot of inner healing. But so much of the, like we were talking about the triggers, that needs healing and you need to grieve sometimes. And it's really hard. There's no pause button in life to do that. And that's why I find either journaling, uh, just get it out there, put it in writing, get your thoughts out of your head and somewhere else, whether you just talk it out with somebody else or talk out loud, or I mean, if you have a faith and you want to pray, whatever you can do, get it out of your head, then it's not swirling around in there because inside our head, it gets bigger and bigger and more catastrophe than when you say it out loud and you're like, wow, that didn't, that didn't sound as bad as it really needed to. If you can talk to someone, find your tribe, find the people who do believe in you. You don't need all this negative energy. There's always going to be a Karen or, you know, who's like telling you what to do and that you're doing something wrong. Of course you are because we can't please everybody, nor are we meant to. You got to do what's right for you. So find the people who believe in you and find that support, whether you have to pay for it or, or find a friend or just vent. Um, because yeah, there's no point storing up all that guilt because you might actually find a solution for, for when you do talk to people, when you let people know what you're struggling with, you might be amazed that, that, you know, the world brings you that, that answer that you didn't even know you were looking for. Right. And I, and you know, I see on TV, I, and I'm really limiting my TV watching these days. Um, but I see scrolling on CP24, you know, helplines, distress centers, you can call if you're older, but for kids, the Kids Cell Phone Foundation, which is a real big charity for me. It's probably my go-to charity in terms of giving. Um, and I used to work, like do um, fundraising work with them. Uh, so the Kids Help Phone for the kids, I think you got to let your kids know that these things are out there. And then parents, you got to know, like ask for help, you know, call a if, if you want to call a prayer line, you know, whatever, like get, get the help you need. Right. Um, this is wonderful today. I appreciate you doing this, Megan. Where, where do we reach you to learn more and, and possibly work with you? And I'll just go. I am everywhere on social media as joyful mud puddles. So I'm on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, Pinterest, like everywhere, not on Twitter yet. So everywhere, but Twitter. Um, but it's joyful mud puddles 
and that's how you could find me. And there's my offer. There's my boys. <laughs> that's not our chicken. <laughs> although we do, it's not our chicken. Although we do live in a forest, but um, yeah. And uh, and that's the eldest that's helping you. I take it in the grace way. Yes. Yeah, we have a kids course that is focusing on kids. Like he's demonstrating actually the coping skills of how to do these things instead of a parent or an adult always telling you breathe well what does that actually look like for a kid to do these breathing techniques so we um we have a kids program and then i have a parenting support and then i'm i'm also a homeschooling coach because all these parents are thrown into oh my gosh i feel like i should homeschool what is homeschooling what do i do and so i'm offering you know group coaching at a lower price and then individual coaching to really help you if you want to some added support there. I, I like the idea of homeschooling. I'm not so uh, bent out of shape on that. You know, I think uh, I think you can learn just as much as home as you, you probably more. You know, it's like like I I I um I now work from home and I I got a lot done in in my day. You know, uh, it, it does not take eight hours. We're done. You know, two three at three is max. Like two hours. You condense that all in. You've got the whole day to explore your interests, go on big adventures, create family memories, mm -hmm. work on all these life skills we've been talking about, um, and really customize to your child and their needs and what's unique about your family. Yeah. Yeah. I just wrote, um, I was involved in this project called Love Week, and um, I wrote uh, uh, five cards to seniors that are, that are gonna be delivered in bulk. So I wrote five cards, this one wrote five, that one wrote five, and it's going to a seniors facility. And it's just little cards of hope. <laughs> I love that. No, so you can do that with your kids too, right? Yeah, there's so many different things you can do to give back. And then it, it, we were talking about how everyone's feeling depressed and, and you know, giving back and showing gratitude and being thankful just totally lightens your mood. Yeah, I totally agree. Megan, this was a joy. Thank you for this today. Thank you for having me. I love that. Joyful Mud Puddles. And our guest today was Megan Jackson. Um, and uh, do tap into these resources and, and Megan. Um, that does it for today's show, the Good Morning Show. Hopefully it raised your vibe a little bit and give you some good parenting skills to take away or share. And also, if you like to like this program and you want to donate a bit, just go below to our Patreon page where you can donate a little bit of money, but you get things. You get, you get some coaching from me and little documents and things like that. So thanks a lot, everybody, for watching today. We'll be back next week after the long weekend because uh, we're moving into a long weekend. We all, we all forget because it still feels like hot day where one day goes into the other so uh, have a good week everybody and megan what a joy thank you so much thank you bye everyone